Live from the Washington, D.C. area, all empowered citizens need to know about intelligent use of resources, smart governance, inclusive communities, smart industry, and healthy, thriving urbanization. This is Smart Sustainability, the TV talk about shaping a sustainable future in the digital age with Nicolette Stividar. Welcome to Smart Sustainability on March 13, 2022. No war is in essence a new war. History repeats itself until we actually break the cycle. We all carry parts of history in us that is waiting to be released. Since World War II, we haven't been so close to war as we are today. What's going on with Russia and the Ukraine is not only prompting us for a hopefully great awakening to what destiny we want to face going forward and shape as humanity, but also to coming to grips with healing the past and hopefully learning lessons. Putin's march into the Ukraine threw us back to a chapter in history that was up to now a taboo topic. We talk about the ethnic Germans, something few know about, what became also clear on the Rachel Maddow show last night. Why the tragic fate of ethnic Germans still plays a role today and the lessons we can all learn from it, our topic tonight. Good evening, thanks for joining us. I'm Nicolette de Vidar. Hitler's annexation of the so-called Sudetenland was the trigger to World War II. It set events and a terrible dynamic in motion that turned into a gruesome reality to war with millions of people killed, murdered and extinct. What's less known is also the gruesome beginning to peace in 1945. The story of the Sudeten isn't only about Hitler and Putin or the comparison of the two, and then also not only about who was when killed. It's a story of multicultural states, minorities' rights, equity and inclusion. You see topics that are at the very heart of what we actually grapple with today. So let me take you on a journey through history this evening and you'll pick up the pieces. First there was a massacre of the Nazis, then three million ethnic Germans expelled and partially extinct and their culture erased after World War II. A forgotten genocide of people who were German ethnicities but were living in Bohemia, Moravia and Silesia outside of Germany. You can see on the map where they are. Then a lot of arguing between countries up to now as a result of that. Guilt, silence about a topic that was long taboo. The rich 800 year history ended in a tragedy of blood and suffering and echoes to this very day at the center of European politics, at the center of understanding critical pieces to building the peaceful world we want to live in tomorrow. Hitler's annexation of the Sudetenland in the appeasement of Munich in 1938 was the trigger to World War II. Sudetenland is a story of multiculture, the richness of centuries, nationalism, cycles, integration, change and transformation. So what was it actually all about? And who are the Sudeten? Let's start with a few terms. The Sudeten Germans. Sudeten is a mountain range in the middle of Europe, today located in the Czech Republic at the border with Germany, Austria and Poland. An area so vast of unspoiled nature in the midst of a grandiose mystical forest full of legends fairy tales, craftsmanship, and culture. The term Sudeten, though, doesn't refer to ethnic Germans who lived in those mountains, but it also includes all people of German origin living throughout Bohemia and Moravia. Bohemia and Moravia are the areas you saw on the map, so look them up. I think it's important to understand their location. At the beginning of the 20th century, people with German origin lived predominantly in Bohemia and Moravia. Ethnic Germans had their own culture, their traditions, their language, even their own wind. There's a term which we use today called the Bemische, which describes a particular quality of the wind in those areas. The term Sudeten wasn't until the 20th century. It's actually a political term. 
Before, the ethnic Germans living in Bohemia and Moravia were called German Bohemians and German Moravians, quite simple. So let's look at the beginning of this very rich history at the center of Europe, the beginning, which really was kind of the beginning of the real Europe in the sense of multi-people, multi-cultures. The Slavic tribes that lived in Central Europe became a part of history when Charlemagne became the reigning sovereign over the Bohemian tribes shortly after 800 AD. In 1158, Bohemia became a kingdom. Beginning with the 13th century, the kings of Bohemia came traditionally from the House of Luxembourg. Since 1526, the Bohemian kings came from the dynasty of the House Habsburg. The sovereigns of the Bohemian lands recognized early on, back in the 12th century, that much of the Slavic lands were too big and underused economically. Farming, trade and businesses weren't developed, so they began to call in German settlers into their lands. Since the 12th century, German settlers put down roots in the and found in Bohemia practically a new homeland. Farmers, traders, craftsmen, builders came to settle, trusting the promises made by the kings for a new homeland for work, bread, and earnings. Because the middle part of Bohemia was already occupied by the Slavic people, the German settlers dispersed around the mountain area, the Sudeten Mountains. They founded villages, built homes, and put in tremendous efforts over the centuries to turn the wild, vast forests into fertile farmland. Trade and mining were also developed very quickly as well. Around 1300, the Bohemian lands had already changed and began blossoming in abundance and prosperity. By 1500, most of the Bohemian cities were of German origin. They were administered as independent cities using German city administration basics. The pioneering spirit of the settler made basically the nobility of the Bohemian lands the wealthiest in the entire Holy Roman Empire of German nation. The nobility, the landowners, give the German settlers therefore the same rights as they had originally in their native homelands before they came to Bohemia. The German language had been present since the 9th century. Since about 1350, Prague, today the capital of the Czech Republic, was one of the most important cities in the Holy Roman Empire of German nation. It was the residence of Karl IV, who was crowned the first emperor of the Holy Roman Empire. In, the coronation was in Rome in 1356. Bohemia was one of the strongest and economically most important areas of the entire empire, a pearl of economic settling success, you would say today. In 1348, Prague founded the first university of Central Europe. It was a multicultural environment, consisting of Jews, Czechs, Germans, and other ethnicities that lived together, a mini Europe, so to speak. A time when people sorted out who has something to say, when and where, who belonged to whom, and where was the best place for everyone. At the time, back then, people didn't sort themselves by language or ethnicity, but by ownership, religion, or class. Because of the tremendous success of the ethnic Germans in the settlements, the Slavic people started to develop jealousy. The real exploiters, though, was a different group. They were the Bohemian nobility. The ethnic German farmers, like the Czech people, had to serve the Bohemian nobility and pay one-tenth of their earnings. So with all the tensions going on, the first civil war between ethnic Germans and Czechs began back in 1419 and lasted for 17 years. Germans were the main sufferers, they were decimized. 1,500 villages had disappeared, cities were destroyed, and Bohemia was back in shambles. From that moment on, for 200 years, the Germans were deprived of their rights, their language was forbidden, and you can see there was a tense relationship developing early on. This tense relationship culminated in the defenestration of Prague, which was the birthing of the Thirty Years' War, which was also ignited, you guessed it, in Bohemia. We don't have enough time to go into all the details of this very rich history, so I want to fast forward 
At the end of the Thirty Year War, 1648, Bohemian nobility was abolished and Bohemia and Moravia became part of the Habsburg Empire. Now, with Bohemia belonging to the Habsburg Empire, the Czech population reached its lowest point politically, culturally, and language wise. The nationalistic movement, which actually began in France in the 19th century, also reached Bohemia and further affected the relationship between the Czechs and the ethnic Germans. You had people who believed in nationalism and ethnicity. In the 19th century, all these thoughts were already coming through. They demanded that each ethnic group has a right to self-determination. As a consequence, the Habsburg Emperor in Austria gave the Czechs their rights for their own schools, their own language. But the Czechs wanted more. It wasn't enough. Thinking that all groups of a particular ethnic origin belong together and should live among themselves, they demanded their own state. And that's when the trouble began. Because throughout Europe, particularly in Eastern Europe, people of various ethnic groups were pretty dispersed. It was the basis of their existence, what you could see at the beginning of the map. The same was true for the Sudeten. They were dispersed all around the mountain range, covering Bohemia, Moravia, and Silesia. So remember, today on the map, it's the area of Germany, Czech, uh, Austria, and Poland. So the idea of an independent state according to ethnicity where people lived wasn't really possible or feasible. So with an increasing nationalistic movement, people of different ethnicities who used to live and work successfully together for centuries began increasingly living segregated lives. Who used to identify as Bohemian was now split into either Czech or German. Quite a stretch, isn't it? Remember not to be confused with the German Germans who lived in the German Reich. So this dividing identities into German and Czech from what used to be embraced as integrated Bohemian ethnicity plays a significant role during the founding of the Czech state later and the tragedy that followed. Since 1900, the various ethnic groups started closely watching each other making sure, well, first of all, distrusting, and then making sure none of them got more rights than the other. It led to many arguments, and a way to summarize this is that practically every duolingual city sign caused already a major conflict. This is when society began to change, really change. Segregated schools were built, churches, even political parties. You had, for example, in Bohemia, two social democratic political parties, a German social democratic party and a Czech social democratic party. None of this makes any sense if you think about it, because despite the fact that the democratic parties actually said they represented inclusion and solidarity for the unity of the working class, while well, you get in the drift, you still had two parties essentially representing the same thing, however separate in different countries. Hmm. So, up to 1918, Bohemia was part of the Austrian-Hungarian Empire. Czech leaders, though, had pursued the dream of an independent Slavic state already a while ago. To further that goal, they spread untruths about actual size of the ethnic German population. As an example, they would say, oh, there's only two million Sudeten Germans that lived in Bohemia, when in reality, it was an entire million more, three million. They denied the entire existence of the German settlement areas that had occurred for the past 800 years. And with that, their history. When the first Czech state had been founded in 1918, they inherited the richest areas of all of the Austrian-Hungarian Empire. There were fertile farms, booming industry, a flourishing infrastructure, and most of them were built by the ethnic Germans dispersed around. Czechoslovakia, was part of the peace negotiation, despite the fact that they actually hadn't existed as an official state at that point of time yet. Edvard Benesch, a Czech political figure, asserted himself with the support of France after years of doing a negative campaign against ethnic Germans that the first Czechoslovakian Republic was proclaimed in October 1918 in Philadelphia. Yes, you heard right in Philadelphia. 
in absence of an actual peace treaty. Now, the biggest ethnic group in this newly formed state were the Czechs, but there was still a population of 23.5% who were ethnic Germans. The German Bohemian Landesversammlung, the group representing Sudeten Germans, asked that the Sudetenland inhabited by the, German, by the ethnic Germans should become part of Austria in the new forming order of Europe after World War I. Well, why? Because it shared the language and cultural roots. They were denied by the Allies, and the Czech government in Prague perceived this whole request of the Sudeten as treason. As a result, the Sudetenland of course, when you look back, why would this do though? Because the Sudetenland was the most productive and resource rich area of Czechoslovakia with industries such as glass, porcelain, textile. Of course, they weren't going to give it up. Doesn't make sense, does it? But as a result, Czech legions occupied the Sudetenland with brutal force. In 1919, during negotiations of the Treaty of Versailles, the Czech government assured the Allies that the Sudeten Germans would receive the very same rights as the Czechs and the Slavs. The German language would be the second language of Czechoslovakia and no, no oppression would happen. Reality is, none of it was true. The Allies later admitted that they had been deceived by the Czech leaders. There's actually a documentation on that that uh, you can see in documentary movies. We didn't have the rights to it, so I couldn't include it. The Czech government treated the Czech population much better than the German population. Rights that the Germans used to have were abolished. German schools were closed. In land reforms, their land was seized by the government and redistributed to the Czechs. Czech administrators were replacing German-speaking administrations in the German settlements. Government contracts were given to Czechs, not to Sudeten. The German Bohemians had become less than a tolerated minority, though they constituted three million inhabitants. Now, naturally, that had to lead to one disaster sooner or later. Along comes Wall Street, 1929. So because of its economic infrastructure and industrial focus, the crash of Wall Street hit the Sudetenland especially hard. Due to the oppression and being treated as a minority by the Czech government in Prague, frustration among the Sudeten grew and voices became much louder that they would be better off, perhaps, if they could become part of the neighboring Germany. Henlein, the leader of the Sudeten National Party at the time, demanded autonomy of the Sudetenland. In political elections, in fact, his party had more votes than the strongest Czech party. Nevertheless, Edvard Benesch, then Czech president, showed no consideration. Henlein brought the frustration of the Sudeten Germans to Hitler's attention, who had come to power in 1933. Needless to say, the situation grew really tense. 1938, Benesch mobilized 1.5 million Czech soldiers and proclaimed a Standrecht, it's kind of an emergency act over the Sudetenland, the soldiers confiscated all of the Sudeten radios, held 20,000 Sudeten hostage, destroyed tunnels, bridges, and train tracks. That was the pretext for Hitler to demand that Sudetenland be annexed by Germany. Now remember, World War I had just been over in 1918. Everyone in Europe was terrified of a new war. We're talking 20 years apart. So in the Munich appeasement of 1938, France, Great Britain, Italy agreed that Germany could annex the Sudetenland. The, Su the Czech government, though, was not part of the negotiations, neither were the people, but it accepted the annexation. The ethnic German minorities in Czechoslovakia then served kind of as a doormat for Hitler, beginning at the October 1938 when he marched into the Sudetenland. The Sudeten didn't know much about Hitler's NSDAP goals or orientation of the party. For many of them, the annexation was a door to freedom, their rights being restored. Just in 1938, after Hitler had marched into the Sudetenland, 
The Gestapo had deported 2,500 Sudeten Germans to concentration camp to the concentration camp in Dachau. All in all, the Nazis deported 20,000 Sudeten Germans, 30,000 fled to other countries, and 300,000 Jews in Bohemia died. Hitler, however, had other goals, of course, as we all know. He moved on marching into Prague, 1939. The Czechs suffered under the occupation of the German Wehrmacht, no question. Himmler stated the goal of the Nazis in Bohemia and Moravia really was war would be senseless if it didn't result in a full German settlement in Bohemia and Moravia based on race and the purity of blood. The Nazis committed atrocious acts in Czechoslovakia. When the German Wehrmacht withdrew in 1945, the brutality was reversed. Now the Sudeten, first used by the Nazis, now were the first point of anger for the Czechs and the advancing Red Army. More than two ger million German women were raped by the Red Army, including girls as young as five years old. The Czechs directed all their anger from the Nazis, but also the century-long conflict with German settlers who had been there for 800 years and built the most prosperous area of the Czech lands. The Czech militia took brutal revenge on the ethnic Germans, the Sudeten. Never mind that many Sudeten were fighting in the Czech army during the war. Never mind that some had Jewish roots. Edward Benesch has held an important role in Czech politics since 1918, became president of the newly found Czechoslovakia, where he declared at the end of October 1945, today it's clear that the majority of Germans since 1934 was in full agreement of Hitler's doing and has worked towards the full destruction of our country and thus is to be held fully responsible for what the Nazis did. Let that sink in for a moment. It was a carte blanche for brutality, massacre, and another injustice. He pointed out that a joint life in Czechoslovakia that had been the backbone of the country for almost a millennia was impossible, and that it was time to find a, quote, final solution to the long-held German problem in our lands, and cleanse Czechoslovakia once and for all from German hands. The end of Czechoslovakia with German settlers would be written in blood. What happened was actually worse. During peace talks, Churchill once said, enjoy the war because peace will be savage. Yep, it was. The Sudeten Germans that lived in their homelands for 800 years were supposed to be transferred in an orderly way to what became the newly created Republic of Germany. Three million Sudeten Germans were about to be disowned plundered, expelled, brutally mistreated, all their lands, property and belongings confiscated without uh, compensation to this very day. Punishment excursions took place where Sudeten were brutally murdered. And you do see a video in there, I would advise, viewer discretion is advised, this is not suitable material for children. What was supposed to be an orderly transfer turned out to be a wild expulsion with a brutality that rivaled what just occurred in the war by the Nazis. Czech militias knocked on people's doors and dragged them out in the streets. Families were pulled out of the house. Children dragged out of schools. Systematic expulsions took place. Ethnic Germans had to wear white bands with an N on their arms, similar to the yellow star of David that the Jewish people had to wear during Nazi time. N standing for Nimitz, the Czech word for German. There were curfews in place. Germans were not allowed to use public sidewalks or streets and they could only go shop at certain hours. They were put into forced labor camps. Many were moved to concentration camps such as Theresienstadt. Some concentration camps, in fact, were kept open till 1950 for those who weren't allowed to leave during the expulsion. There are many stories that came out in recent years about the brutal mistreatment of the Sudeten. Villages that were wiped out and killed, babies beaten to death, men randomly shot, people brutally beaten, tortured and simply thrown on the street, run over by trucks. 
all of Bohemia was turned into a giant concentration camp. The Sudetens were no more citizens. Their citizenship had been revoked. Remember, at this point, they belonged nowhere and to no one. They had no right to exist. Women had a duty to work and serve. All women. Schools and churches were closed and even the clerics were put into forced labor. Those who were expelled had to march 40 miles and more to get to neighboring Austria and Germany, and many didn't survive the march. The numbers of how many Sudeten Germans were killed during what is considered the largest ethnic expulsion in history varies greatly. The German government puts the number at 240,000, but including the expulsion also from the eastern areas, from Prussia and the former eastern German areas, that number can go as high as 2 million. Before the actual expulsion took place, the Sudeten Germans were supposed, apparently, to go through an ocean of blood and tears. Their culture, 800-year history, wiped out. A forgotten genocide that plays a role in history to this very day. Now here's why. Benesch had issued the so-called Benesch Decrees in 1948. He did so retroactively, which provided the legal grounds for the wild expulsion of Sudeten, in which he declared that any crime against a German wasn't a crime. It was legal and just for the fight of freedom as retribution for the crimes committed by the Nazis. Mind you, at this point, we're talking 1948. The war ended in 1945. The Sudeten were punished for a crime they themselves had little to do with, and the Allies had watched once again how crimes against humanity were committed with no one saying a word. Till today. It's 2022. So what happened to the ethnic Germans when they actually made it to those who made it to Germany? Well, many were treated by German Germans as second-class citizens when they arrived. With Germany being in rubble, cities completely bombed, and the country struggling with the rebuilding, Germans had their hands full with their own country. They didn't want to share, and certainly not with people who had nothing but the clothes on their back. They spoke differently, had different traditions, different cultures. Many Sudeten Germans came from highly cultured areas such as Karlsbad, the Golden City, as my family did. They had an industrial background, were successful business people in Bohemia, a country with a century-rich tradition of multiculture, craftsmanship and cultural vibrancy. Bohemia was far advanced through the centuries in a cultural exchange and political decision-making and multicultural interaction, with Central Europe's first university, spa towns that dated back to Charlemagne. They had a more export-oriented international outlook to life. Let me name a few Sudeten for you, so you actually have an idea. Oskar Schindler was a Sudeten. Ferdinand Porsche was a Sudeten. Yes, the founder of Porsche Cars. Many of those people that were expelled rebuilt factories and industry. But it took some time. About one million Sudeten Germans were transferred to West Germany, Bavaria. Since the German cities had no capacities, most of them were sent to the rural areas because rural areas had less suffered from war damage and were thought to be better suited. Now, Sudetens were housed in resettlement camps, such as in Wiesau, a small town a few miles from the Czech border, where about 7,000 resettlers arrived in trains per day. Now, small community with 7,000 settlers. The Sudeten lived in these camps several years before they could find a way to stand on their own. My grandparents told me that the people in Wiesau looked down on them as foreigners, and those who managed to bring some things out, like jewelry, were ripped off the belongings, the locals being charged high prices for meat and groceries. We, for example, I know that from my grandfather, paid for meat and groceries with rings, that, as my grandmother said, they got out by putting that in sausages when they were kicked out of their, their house. Conditions in these camps were kind of subhuman. So with the post-war economic boom, though, many could rebuild their lives. In our case, by 1952, my grandfather had rebuilt a porcelain factory in that small town of Wiesau. We changed trademarks, that's it, from JKW Karlsbad to JKW West Germany, 
built housing for other settlers who wanted to learn the craft, trained them, and decades later, some of them started their own businesses. I sometimes believe my family stayed so close to the Czech border because they hoped to be able to go home one day. The local communities, though, in Western Germany, envious with what the Sudeten Germans that came with nothing and yet managed to rebuild, were plagued by jealousy, a kind of repetition of what happened before it took place. And in the rural areas, sporting what became the Iron Curtain post-war, people, eh, they had a pretty closed mind developed and an extremely strong tribal culture and belonging not really integrating the Bohemians for a few generations. I asked my grandmother one day as to why she wouldn't visit the Czech area, which during communism we could, you just had to ask for permission, right? She replied she would go one day to Prague and Iga and Karlsbad when the borders are back open. When my grandmother died in 1986, the Iron Curtain fell in 1989. The Benesh degrees, from 45 remain a problem today. There's a part of unresolved history still influencing Europe. Now, why is that the case? Well, the Sudeten Germans' journey wasn't over when they came to Germany after the war. There were many traumas and personal issues to, de to deal with. First of all, practical things. You had to rebuild your lives with nothing, from nothing, and in a hostile environment. You were uprooted and dealt with loss and grief. You faced a completely different culture. Bohemia, as a thriving multicultural open culture for centuries, the rural German areas, by contrast, were narrow-minded people, many of them extremely poor. Germany, loaded with guilt, didn't want to talk about loss and expulsion. In fact, no one there wanted to. Anything that had to do with the war was silenced in societies as well as in families. The whole focus was on rebuilding. The thinking was we survived, we lived, let's go through. Germans didn't really start talking about the war and the Holocaust until the following generations. Our generation actually started to ask questions and began to work through history. East Germany, after the war under Soviet occupation, didn't want to have any talks about expulsion as they were kind of busy and trying to keep Germans from moving further west. And then Czechoslovakia, well, that was now a socialist brother state. And in among those, oh, you don't point out each other's crimes. And in Western Germany, new organizations were cropping up that represented the interest of the expelled Sudeten. Of course, at the very heart of these things were the claims for return of property, return of lands, and reparations. Within Germany, in the political scene, that posed a problem post-World War. Because Bavaria, the largest state in Germany, who took in one million Sudetens, stood with the Sudeten Germans in their demands for return of land. But the Chancellor of Germany at the time, Willy Brandt, pursued a policy of making peace with the East in which the Sudeten question marked a huge disruption that no one could have or afford. It had no place. The conflicts last from, 25, from 1945 till now. The relationship between Czechoslovakia and Germany started to relax a little bit after the fall of the Iron Curtain in 1989 then President of the Czech Republic, Václav Havel, apologized for the suffering and the injustice done to the Sudeten Germans by Czech hands. However, in 2002, the then German Chancellor Gerhard Schröder canceled a trip to Prague due to the question of why the Benish decrees were still active today. Yes, remember those decrees that said that committing a crime against a German wasn't really a crime? Hmm, they're still active today, 2022. Because, as you can see, because they were still active, it was a problem for the Czech Republic to become a full member of the European Union. So despite the difficult past, people who lived at the borderlands on the Czech and on the German side started to re-engage. Conversations began, visits of Czechs to Germany and Germans to the Czech Republic restarted, commuter traffic began. Once again, the region became closer to what once could be described as a multicultural existence. 
By 2015, the Sudeten German Representative Association seized their claims for return of lands. So while people and politics have gotten closer, the actual heart of the conflict, though, is still being dodged. It's as central in Europe as is as central to the conflict today. So often, painful issues are bypassed and suppressed by saying, oh, let's just forget the past and focus on the future. Reality, though, is that the past lives on in all of us. It keeps repeating itself until it has been recognized, acknowledged, and integrated before anyone can really move on. America is learning this fact by how we integrate the Ameri African American history and the Native American history. There's so much to work through, recognize, and acknowledge. And now with all that's happening in Ukraine, we're being thrown right back in history. Different place, different actor, same playbook, and same lessons. You have to ask yourself though, why is actually the Sudeten fate still dodged? Why don't we talk about this? And what, can, what are really learning lessons from that? So with the EU, European Union, wanting to expand east, a claim for return of lands and reparations, was contradictory to the EU's expansion plans in the middle of Europe. Remember the map? It's literally right in the center of Europe. So once again, for the greater idea, the Sudeten, or their descendants, us in this case, paid the price. They paid it when the Nazis came in. They paid it when Germany lost the war. And they're paying now in the name of the EU while still waiting to be acknowledged for the atrocity they experienced. For the Holocaust, as terrible as it was, it was awful. And remember, most of us, many of us, also have Jewish roots. So in our case, we actually experienced it on both sides. We lost Jewish members of the family and then went through the same pain and loss the other way around, when the East had advanced towards the West. So for the Holocaust, there was punishment of the Nazis to some degree and to the contributors to some degree. For what happened to the Sudeten, there was absolutely none. To this very day, with Russia's march into Ukraine, this question though can no longer be dodged because we start making comparisons of history. So for us to not repeat the same mistakes and perhaps look at different options, the complex interactions and entanglements of minorities are at the heart of breaking the playbook. Let's start doing that, because no war is in essence a new war. It's the acknowledgement, embracing, releasing of how we integrate history and find positive movement forward. And the big part of this is resolving past trauma. Expelled Sudeten and their families experience many of them. First, the expulsion, the loss of everything you owned, your homeland, your roots where generations of you lived before, the guilt of the Nazi time, the history and guilt as to how Sudetenland contributed to World War II, remember, it was the trigger, and the atrocities that occurred from that. And for some also, the combination of the Holocaust with Jewish roots. Like in my family, as I said, we had both origins. There was so much trauma the children of the expelled Sudeten often turned away from family history because they want to leave the trauma behind and want nothing to do with that. And since the Versöhnungspolitik, uh, making peace policy of Willy Brandt, the expelled were considered troublemakers because their reality, their pain and the injustice they lived through disturbed the big picture and this newfound focus on peace and expansion. It's a little bit like when someone tells a woman who's been raped to just forget about it and focus on the future. Well, tell that to those victims that happened to. Also, what's still a missing piece to African-American history in the United States, I think. Affirmative action and quotas are not the same as when someone acknowledges history. As a Sudeten descendant, I can certainly attest to that, at least from our end, but I think it's pretty much the same or very similar to what African Americans encounter. The biggest counterproductive part to healing is this constant dodging of that which needs to be acknowledged in order to be integrated. 
Otherwise, it's just a Band-Aid and emotional suppression that comes to the forefront at the very next conflict. So after German reunification in 1880, everyone talked about Germany growing together, rebuilding the German nation, and once again, no one wanted to hear or face the story of the Sudeten German expulsion, which is intrinsic and central to German history, difficult to talk about, but also to Europe. It's our time to look at transgenerational trauma and the injustices that occurred. So how do we do this? Well, we'll let you know. We did pre-tape an interview with a trauma specialist who was really great in, in, in helping a lot of people, on the German side at least, as to walking through. Now remember, it's not just the Germans though that are in there. We're talking at this point of time all of Europe is anxious, nervous. You have the Eastern Bloc of the country. So we have a lot of people who had been through trauma, but then also through trauma through communism, lost their freedoms, etc. How we all deal with this, what this triggers, and how it all comes together is really an essential piece. So let's play the video and listen in to how, what, what kind of the key themes are that these people focus or have to deal with. Why is no war really a new war? Because, because old traumas are basically taken over from your previous generation. So whatever your grandparents experienced, this is something that you experience as well. So how do we imagine this? How can something like this express itself? Often in today's life, it's really difficult to sometimes detect what actually has become a transgenerational trauma or what have you taken from your experience, from your, your, your grand. I'm not sure what just happened, but it's seems that the video didn't play. Well, in any case, we did actually, I would invite you, I'm, I'm going to upload... And parents in your subconsciousness, and it kind of lives out in life without you even knowing it. So how can we make the bridge and detect if something was transmitted from the past? The people affected, they feel within them that something doesn't feel quite right. So they, many say they fall in kind of a black hole. They feel the energy, but they have no idea what it's actually about. And that means that very often you have basically, you carry painful experiences from your ancestors in your own life. It expresses itself that some people have some of these past uh, themes from previous generations that in, in certain areas of their life they simply can't progress. That can be in relationships, it can be in work, it can be in uh, their value of self-worth, for example. So it can, for example, be that, for example, you have relationship problems, you want to live in a happy marriage, but instead your life turns out for you to live alone. It can happen that you experience depression and you have no idea where they're coming from. It can happen that you have certain habits developed and you have no idea where, how you actually develop these. You can take over patterns and reactions as, for example, people during the war who were seriously confronted with not having food. It can very well lead to people or generations in this life that they become, they have an inner resistance to throwing away food. So in other words, you can take over reactions, patterns, uh, and, and actions to things that really date back to experiences of your of previous generations. And also express itself for example, in compulsory behaviors. And does that affect everyone in the family in the same way? Or can it be that uh, certain persons in the family, for example, take over or carry more of these past uh, exp uh, and experiences in their lives? For example, among siblings. I've experienced in my practice that the, the basic themes affect every family member, but there's one person in the family Family, who is actually sort of the symptom carrier.
Now we live in a time. Now we live in a time in real crazy times right now, and uh, that kind of puts a lot of our history, particularly in Germany, right at the center again. Yes, in Germany, through the two world wars, there are a lot of people who are tremendously suffering, and there is a lot of collective trauma that has not been dealt with uh, accordingly. I think that most people are actually affected by that, even to this very day. And and it's only beginning to start uh, looking at its own history and beginning to start to look at the trauma that occurred on all sides to work through. Painful experiences weren't talked about after World War II. They were simply suppressed. And many of the survivors of World War II were children at the time who actually needed to find uh, some, you know, being taken in the arms, who needed to find the, the a lot of emotional healing. But because the, the German generations post-World War had to focus totally on rebuilding, this emotional aspect was completely completely suppressed and pushed aside and not ever been talked about or thought about and even more so of course not been worked through or dealt with their fears their pain their their experiences was kind of locked inside and put aside almost as a as a cognitive dissonance sort of that no one could access that's also where the idea comes that don't look at the past look forward focus on the future we need to rebuild now out of all of this what also was a result of course of this is that if if you look at germany post world war you had a generation that that has become a tremendously successful and focused and straightforward looking uh, society. The primary focus of all of this, so the generations post-World War, was mainly on providing material success and abundance for their families once again. But the emotional nourishment was completely neglected. And I think this is something we're facing today and it is something that needs to be looked at. The baby boomer generation was most affected from this emotional deprivation of uh, emotional nourishment, so to speak. They are a generation that really has very little access to themselves or to their own emotions. The Gen X generation really then was the generation that felt that, wait a minute, there's a discrepancy between material wealth and emotional wealth and started to ask questions because they needed to reestablish so to speak, the emotional nourishment and the emotional energies that would flow through. Many of my clients had come to me with a transgenerational trauma or, the, or they suspect that they carry a transgenerational trauma. They really start questioning the family history. They look at the different pieces, they bring them together, and they look at also events that happen to understand what actually happened to their ancestors, what were some of the emotional experiences that were carried forward, and some that were basically reflected in their lives on some level them visit their their places of origin or where the expulsions happened and then acknowledge history plant trees to acknowledge history to become whole again to acknowledge the people that have lost their lives to acknowledge what had happened there and planting a tree is actually a great way of doing this because in a way you're re-establishing your roots so now, very often when we talk about the Second World War, the immediate talk goes about the victims, the Holocaust, these millions of Jews that uh, died in the process, the millions of other ethnicities that died in the process. But then when you look at this, though, there is more to that because also the children of the perpetrators, in a way, they carry their traumas as well and bring them forward into the life. How does this affect or express itself today? So there are victims on all sides. And then, of course, there's the question of guilt. How do we deal with the question of guilt? Working through the historic baggage of the Holocaust and the war itself has become a topic in the 70s and the 80s in Germany. I remember when I went to school, we did a lot of work in terms of how could that happen? How did Hitler rise to, pow rise to power? How uh, did the Germans allow that? How would all of this kind of come into place? 
confronted with that, and we were always being told something like this should never, can never, may never happen again. So it was this open dialogue, this constant confrontation, direct confrontation with the darkest chapter of our history that really helped, I think, for most of our generation to kind of at least look at it from the guilt perspective. Guilt and shame are huge topics in the family. So I don't know, of course, even if we talked about this during school, I think what if, if it actually was resolved sort of in families, that is something that depends on every individual and every individual family. I can also imagine that the topic of rape, when you think about it, two million women, German women were raped after World War II, and many of them never talked about that. So a lot of us also carried the experiences and the unresolved emotions from that to some degree in us. Is that not correct? Um, I, I get to experience that a lot in my work with uh, female clients that come to me. Because shame directly affects the value of how you see yourself as a woman and is really difficult. It takes, it takes a, lot, a long time to work through and deal with, even if you yourself hadn't experienced it. But it, it happened to your grandmother, for example, or your aunt, your great aunt. So in order to resolve that, you can do systemic constellations, ancestry constellations that really give you a clue of what happened, what may have happened, and then you can work through your emotions and release a lot of these painful experiences your ancestors went through. When we look at the war in Ukraine, for example, there is this, it, it triggers a tremendous fear in people all across Europe of a new war. So a lot of these past unresolved trauma that we all carry within us are coming to the forefront. Now, when you look at this, you know, there wasn't just the, the, the world wars, but then there was also, of course, the experience of Eastern Europe, for example, with communism. And when you look at how many countries in Eastern Europe just broke free a few decades ago to really regain their freedom, so to speak, what must be triggered within them in terms of unresolved trauma based on, you know, the, the potential that maybe Russia is going to come in and take over once again and they would lose their freedom. Yeah, I definitely think that's the case, and I'm observing also there is a slight difference between uh, people in East Germany, for example, and West Germany in terms of how to react to what's happening in Ukraine, for example, and how differently the trauma or the past trauma, the unresolved trauma, is kind of coming to the forefront. This is a collective trauma. All of Europe is collectively traumatized from the war in some way. And uh, Eastern Germans, for example, they have a double trauma because then they look at, oh my God, if this is happening again and Russia comes in and we're, we lose our freedom again, in addition to all the unresolved traumas that actually happened from the, during the wars, this is quite an explosive mixture and the same is happening, of course, in Eastern countries. Uh, the march into Ukraine sparks a lot of comparisons to Hitler's march into Czechoslovakia. Now, when you look at collective trauma, how does the trauma of expulsion play a role, for example? How does it express itself? And how can people whose, whose grandparents, great-grandparents, relatives experience that, how would they, how would they recognize uh, a, a trauma or that they carry a trauma still to this very day? The full conversation, uh, you, you obviously gathered it, I, we, we, I translated it, it was a conversation in German. The full conversation you can actually watch in the translated version as well as the German uh, version on YouTube in a few days. Um, there's still a lot to be in and a lot to be covered, which I really think at this day it does matter. It matters big time, not just in terms of what's happening in Ukraine, between Ukraine and Russia and putting it all in context, but also what are the key lessons we can learn from that to, to go forward and make sure none of this ever happens again. So there are also other lessons we can we really can draw from and look at how did it get to that point I told you the story of the Sudeten Germans which is at the center 
of Europe at in, in geographically, but also at the European idea and then very much at the center of this whole concept of sustainability. Because in sustainability, this is all about diversity, inclusion, it's about equity, it's about working together. This is about, we can only get there if we really come to grips with history and sort of learn the lessons from there and see the dynamics that have been in place, the processes that come. There never is only one side to history. History has many faces and all of us have many, many roots. So it really is quite essential to kind of learn the lessons and sit down with history and look more than one book to really ascertain what really happened. So we can learn from the multicultural aspect. How do we actually live together in a multicultural society the best way that ensures equity and inclusion, which, by the way, is the basis, the very basis for peace and respect? How can we sort of focus on still having some traditions and identity and not being that with an issue for sort of the overall collaboration? How can we, what's the value system we look at? We learned at the time there's the value of freedom. For most people actually experienced World War II, freedom has a very high value. And even that, you know, now we've been living in peace for so long, we have a different relationship to freedom that we need to stand up for and kind of redefine and learn. We've just learned that through COVID. There's a lot of transgenerational trauma that we all carry doesn't matter where you are, you all carry a piece of your history, whether this is in the African American community where you dealt with actually a lot of similar traumas than, for example, the expelled Sudeten did. So that uprooting, that coming to a different country, that being cut off from your homeland, this being taken away from your families, all these things, they leave a trace. And they're not being healed or dealt with if we just suppress them. They can only be healed with if we actually look at it. Yes, it hurts. It's painful. I can only tell you, while I was working on this episode, it was really a hard time for me to put this all together because it was quite emotional. So I do invite you, be open to history, have the courage to approach those topics in your family, start asking questions, start talking about this, because that really is the only way for us to go forward and understand. In that sense, thank you so much for watching. I wish you a wonderful evening and I'll see you next week. <clears throat> have a good night.